Hi CFC, I'm Patrick and I lead the community group ministry here at CFC. If you're checking out CFC for the first time, we're glad you're here joining us. Parents, this is the last weekend to register and receive your free Backyard Community Kids Camp Kit. The kit contains everything you need to run a two-hour camp for four days at your home alongside online large group leaders. Register today at communityfellowship.com. We would love for you to join us on July 18th at 12.30 at Amos Her Park in Landisville for a family day picnic. Bring your own lunch and a lawn game to share. We'll provide the drinks and root beer floats. We'll also enjoy eating together, lawn game time, family activities, and a worship time. Register at our website for the CFC Summer of Connections Family Picnic at A. Her Park. Hey CFC, welcome to our online services this weekend. We're so glad that you joined us and tuned in uh, online here to worship with us and again to grow in your faith uh, just through this time of worship and music and through the teaching that Bobby's going to share with us this weekend. Um, we just want to invite you to sing along with us. If this is a time that uh, you just want to commune with God through music, please sing along. Uh, if this is a time that you just want to open the Word of God while the music's happening and just uh, connect with Him through that, just meditating on His Word. Take the time to do that as well. This is just a wonderful opportunity to connect with the Lord uh, together as a church, even though we are scattered uh, scattered apart. Uh, my name's Dan. This is uh, my wife, Lauren, and then my friends, Drew and Caleb, back here. We'll be leading you guys in worship. All right, let's sing together, church.
salvation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be
is sometimes hard to believe it, sometimes hard to, to recognize it and wrestle with it, just how beautiful, amazing, majestic, and perfect you are. God, it is just outside our comprehension. But God, we know that you are a God that is close, close to our hearts, at work molding us, God, in our every walk and every step. God, may our worship be beyond singing alone. May it be living in the every moment. In Jesus' name, we sing and we pray. Amen. Well, hey, CFC, it's great to be able to connect with you guys again. And it's been an interesting week. I was able to do a wedding. And so that was kind of exciting to be able to get back into that. And uh, it was, what was interesting about it is that the wedding happened right as that new Pennsylvania mandate came out. So half the people there were wondering, should I have a mask on? Should I not have a mask on? And I was quickly able to grab one from um, my wife, Jen, from her workplace that is a, sh a face shield. So you should have seen uh, me do doing this wedding with a face shield on. I have a friend who's an astronaut as well. So I'm gonna see if I can get one of those helmets from him. But actually, it's just funny, this week has been like to mask or not to mask. And it really is just a first world problem, if that's the worst of our problems, right, is to wear a mask. I actually decided just to wear one in case, you know, for this recording so that we're good to go. No, I'm just kidding. Um, that has been some of the issue. But I think behind the issue of the mask, a lot is attached to it. There's a lot of um, emotion. There's politics, economics. There's a lot of things that where people are, are frustrated and we, we want to be um, good citizens. The, the, the early church was actually known for having a great reputation for being team players and for being um, um, good community citizens. And we want to do that, but we're really excited because this weekend is the first time where you'll have, a f you'll have four different options. You can watch at home online. Uh, you can have a picnic with a purpose, which is exciting. Uh, you could invite some people over. And then um, a third option would be an outdoor service that we're going to have on Saturday at 7 p.m. and an indoor service Sunday at 10 a.m. And of course, for these things, you do need to register the week prior and make sure that, that we're ready to go for that. So it's exciting. Even though these are tough times, we do have options and God is with us. I believe that God is greatly at work. He's doing some amazing things, even through the hardship, things that he's doing deep in our hearts that perhaps wouldn't normally be done if we weren't going through some of this. So we can take heart and we can trust that, that God's at work. Today we're also going to celebrate communion together. So if you're a believer in Christ, uh, we're going to take a few uh, moments at the end of this talk just to be able to have some time uh, with Christ and, and, um, and uh, take communion, remember what he's done. So if you want, you can prepare by getting uh, some, some bread and some juice or something liquid to drink. And that'll be a time for us together just to celebrate. And that'll be ready for you. If you're just visiting, I'm Pastor Bobby. And we're excited that you've joined in. Uh, I'm not sure where some of you are. We obviously, as you can tell, we believe that there's a God and that he loves you. And we look at the scriptures and we find that if you have the courage to read the scriptures on your own, if you have the courage to look at them, it's amazing that you start reading and you're wondering, is this a message that is just human or did this actually come from God? And it really is powerful. So we've chosen to just shut down some of the human voices and we've chosen to say, man, we really want to look at the Holy Scriptures and see what does God have to say on these certain things. And so we're in the middle of this series, right in the middle of the Gospel of Matthew. It's called The Kingdom Has Come. And there's a dynamic when God arrives on the earth, what does that look like, right? And there's sort of like a clash between the, um, the values and the, the culture that's there, and then God with his values and the things, the message that he has. And that's why we've called this segment right now the Upside Down Kingdom. This is a sub-series within the Gospel of Matthew called the Upside Down Kingdom. I referenced a little bit for you, and the last few had to do with the compassion of Christ versus the selfishness of the Pharisees and the crowds. Last week, we talked about how you and I tend to look on the, um, what we see around us, the, the world that is seen. We live in, in that world, whereas God is challenging us to live by faith and to press into the unseen world. 
we walk by faith and not by sight. That's an upside down concept. Another upside down concept that I'm going to bring out today is that man tends to look on the, out, the outside, but God looks at the heart. That there's this dichotomy of outside inside, and we're going to see that today in Matthew 15 with the Pharisees when they come to talk to God um, and, and to accuse him of something. So here's, here's where the story goes, right? The Pharisees um, are not aware that Jesus probably uh, had, been, had been ministering for so many days and people were coming from all over the place just to touch the, 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 the hem of his cloak and find healing. He's, he has so much compassion, so much time, and so much love being poured out. And yet they send a delegation from Jerusalem to find a way to accuse Jesus and his disciples. And so that's what they do is they come here with this spirit of accusation. Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash with their hands when they eat. And so they come in in this, in, in this accusatory way. I want you to know that as I observe what's going on in America today, to me, it feels like there's a cloud of accusation over this country. It feels like the rhetoric from every news headline to social media is what's wrong with somebody or something. And I want you to know that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, right? He's always going to be pointing a finger and saying, this is what's wrong and that's what's wrong. It's not necessarily new. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? And so it became about what's good and what's bad. And so some of you may feel today, like you say to yourselves, and this is what you're feeling, you're saying, I, I feel like a bad person because I don't social distance properly. I feel embarrassed because I don't give enough money to world hunger. I don't buy GMO coffee, or I'm a meat eater, or I don't have enough racially diverse people in my life. And there are all these many good things, right, that, that are there in our culture that are saying, you should do this and you should do that. And you and I, as we feel that weight of accusation and criticism in our country, can consistently feel more and more like, man, I'm, I'm a terrible person. I'm just never good enough. And then there's some on the other side of that dynamic who pride themselves. And they're like, oh, I hope so-and-so saw that. Or I hope I'm going to do this because of them. And so there's a lot of underlying thought that goes on in your mind and my mind. I'm going to do these things to impress other people so that they see that and think that I'm a good person. And some of you today are carrying a tremendous burden that your goal today is not to offend anybody and to do everything right so that people think you're a great person. And you're carrying that burden today. And so here these, the Pharisees come and they come with that same outside focus, right? They've totally missed that the disciples have left their lives behind. They don't know where they're going to be spending the night. And for three years, they're following Jesus around. That doesn't matter. The love that they have, that they're pouring out, that Jesus is showing, that doesn't matter. But it's like, you're not washing your hands properly. That's the accusation. Now, when you read through the lines here, you find out it's not that they haven't washed their hands to eat. It's that they haven't ceremonially cleansed their hands according to the Talmud, right? So the Talmud was... Um, were added laws that were much more specific than God's Levitical laws in the Old Testament that just were um, very, very detailed on exactly everything you needed to do to be a proper citizen. The Midrash were commentaries about these added laws, and then the rabbinical schools were there, okay, to teach young uh, students exactly how to follow these, and it becomes this cultural norm that for you to be a good person, you have to fulfill all of these laws. And so for, for us, as audacious as it looks for them to say, why are you accusing them of not properly washing their hands? To them, that was the norm. And everybody listening would have been like, yeah, they're right. You know, they have a point. They were the authority. They were the word on the street of what culture says you should do. And if you don't, shame on you. You're a bad person. You have no influence. You shouldn't be telling other people how to live because you're not doing it all right. And so they accuse him, and there's probably this hush there. People are like, oh, they're right. Oh my goodness, they didn't ceremonially wash. What does it mean to ceremonially wash your hands? All right, you have to take a certain amount of water. You have to pour it with your fingers up. You have to pour it over your fingers and let it run down and drop off of your wrists. Then you do that for your other hand. You measure out the right amount of water, 
pour it down, let it drop. Then you turn your hands upside down and you do the same thing, right? And then you have to rub your hands together for so, many, so, so much time and you have to just do it perfectly. And the reason you have to do that is because if you touched a Gentile any time during that day, then you're unclean. And there's also a demon called Shipta who at night he'll come and he'll, cover, he'll start to cover your hands. And so you better make sure that you ceremonially cleanse your hands. <laughs> And that was the word on the street. It's interesting, Jesus kind of approaches their accusation with his answer. He takes it up another level. He's like, oh yeah, they don't fulfill the tradition of the elders. Well, what about you? You're not fulfilling the commandments of God. And so he brings up one of the Ten Commandments that says you need to honor your father and your mother. And then he sort of lays out a dynamic for them in this passage, which is interesting. Um, this, this passage actually in Mark chapter 7 refers to Corbin, which is dedicating your resources to God. And it's the same, the same concept that they, they cry out, Corbin, Corbin. So, so here's the dynamic. There are, um, there are uh, the children of parents who have gotten older, right? And so there, the social security system back then was your kids support you in your old age. So these midlife children, they have certain resources available. And they, they are supposed to honor their father and their mother by supporting them. And the Levitical law even um, says it's punishable by death. In other words, it's so serious for you to say, my parents have poured their lives into me. They have done millions of acts of love to get me to the place to be an independent adult to support myself. And a reflection of God's love would be that when they're old, you better take care of them. All right, so that's, that's the heart of God in this. Honor your father and your mother. Today we have a social security system and retirement accounts, but that's God's heart is to make sure your parents are taken care of. So Corbin is this thing, an added tradition in the Talmud that says you can take all of your resources and, say, and dedicate them to God. And then you can say to your parents, oh, look, you know, I'd love to take care of you guys, but you know, I dedicated all this stuff to God, so I can't really help you. And then according to the Talmud, 10 years, 20 years down the road, you can actually um, say about those resources, um, I'm going to need those. I, I, I know I dedicated those to God. I'm changing my mind on that. I, I'm going to need those resources. You don't actually, with Corbin, you don't bring them to the tabernacle. You just say verbally, Corbin, and then that's dedicated to God. And it's a loophole. It's a way of looking super spiritual. I dedicate that to God. When actually it is heinous. It is, it is sinful. It's unloving to do something like that. So Jesus sort of says to them in verse 6, it's interesting, for the sake of tradition, you've made void the very word of God. For the sake of you doing your little outward appearance thing, you're actually voiding the very words of God when he tells us to love God and to love others. And so then he takes them to the root issue, and this is the first time that he says to them, you're a bunch of hypocrites. <laughs> uh, that's the first time he's saying you are fake. And it, the heat actually turns up in chapter 23. He, talk, he tells them, you know, you're like whitewashed sepulchers. You're full of dead men's bones. On the outside, you look great, right? On the inside, it's disgusting, filthy, rotten selfishness. So the root issue that he talks about is that these people honor me with their lips. And he's quoting the same problem happened back in the day of Isaiah. People are used to doing the religious thing, doing what looks good to others, honoring us with, uh, honoring, um, with their lips, but actually their hearts are so far from God. There's, there's not a sense of really knowing God whatsoever. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of God. And that's the, 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 the deadliness of the emphasis on the outside. The root issue is that your heart is actually far from me. It's upside down. It's focused on outward appearance and not on the heart of man. Is that common today? Is that, is that a problem today? I was thinking about that, the idea your heart is far from me. You know that there are people who can do church um, for selfish reasons. There are people who can sing worship songs for selfish reasons. In reality, they don't really love God or know him. Um, do you know that I've personally struggled with this and it's been an unaware thing and there probably still are roots of that in me? That I grew up as a missionary kid, I became a missionary, I'm a pastor, and much of the motive behind why I do what I do 
is because it's good for me. And I wrestle with that. I struggle with that. I find these selfish things coming up from inside of me. But yet when you take Christianity and you mix it with the American dream, this is what we're hearing from leading pastors in our country right now. And I'm going to quote some of them. This is what we're hearing. Your destiny is calling out. It's time to start living large. Another pastor says, I declare you debt free today, saith the Lord. Another pastor says, I'm asking you to feel good about who you are. One of them says, it's as easy to get healed as it is to get forgiven. And another pastor says, your thoughts and desires will become the will of God. Claim them and make them the will of God. Declare something in the name of God and it becomes God's will. You know, we're prone to really make church about us and how it makes us feel and what it does for us. Some people will say, wow, like Jesus died for my sins. That's pretty cool. Like basically I can do whatever I want and not go to hell. Like that's really convenient. I like that. Other people will say, you know what, Jesus, I'll be so kind and I'll allow you into my heart. Like he really needs you, right? I guess I'll allow you into my heart. Some people will give money, right? And, and they'll say, you know what, I'll give money to God, but he better, you know, give me that raise and bless me and make it work for me. And some people will even go to church, say, I'll go to church as long as it's, you know, convenient and fun. I'll do that. And I've found this, I'll clean up my act because then re- other people will respect me more. And the reason why I live a godly life and do good things has nothing to do with loving God. It has everything to do with being about me again. And I found this is so frustrating to me, CFC, because I find myself consistently that there's, there are these evil motives that are deep and buried in my own heart. I want you to know that that's not the gospel. The gospel starts with repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The gospel starts with agreeing with God that our hearts are desperately wicked and defiled. And that's what Jesus references here. Um, The gospel includes deny yourself and take up a cross. The gospel includes being willing to forsake all to follow me. That's, that's the gospel, right? That's not a fun and it, it doesn't feel great, but it's real and it's true. And that's where there's this collision between our world and God's kingdom. And so I want to go into this teaching. The big idea today is outside, inside. We put a lot of emphasis on what looks good on the outside, what feels good on the outside. And God is saying, no, we need to take a look deeper at the root at at our heart. And so this is what he's teaching us today, that defilement is really an internal problem. It's an internal problem. And this is where he goes with that. He calls the people and he says, hear and understand, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. And then the disciples came and said, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone, they're blind guides, and if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. So Jesus gives us this principle that defilement is really an internal problem. Defilement is not that there are things on the outside that you take in, and then you digest, and and you get rid of them. That's not where the defilement is. Defilement is on the inside. And watch this. When Jesus said that, the crowd must have been like, Oh! Why? Because in the Jewish system, there are all these things that are unclean. Is that kosher? Is that not kosher? Can I eat that? Can I not eat that? And with this statement, Jesus is actually declaring all foods to be clean. It doesn't matter. You're going to, bacteria is going to digest everything. It's going to come out. That's not the issue, right? That's not the issue. And so the disciples right away react. Watch this. They react with this word offended. The the Pharisees are going to be offended. Just on a side note, I want to encourage you in this age of tolerance, just make sure you don't offend anybody. Try to make it your practice at least once a day to offend somebody. <laughs> are you doing the will of God? Like, was, was the purpose of Jesus just to come and not to step on toes? No. He's bringing truth because we need truth. And so there's, there's an offense. Oh no, we offended somebody. 
And so then what I love is that Peter presses in and he says, I want more. T tell me more and explain this. And so Peter um, presses in and Jesus explains a little more in verse 17. Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? <laughs> Don't you see that? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands, does that not defile anyone? So Jesus goes in to explain this a little further. Um, it's out of our own hearts, right, that all of this evil comes. So, so let me ask you this. How does that hit you, right, when there's all this accusation going on out there? Um, what if, according to this, we were all to say, you know what? They're messed up, they're messed up, they're messed up. This political party is messed up, this political party is messed up, this group of people is messed up, this group of people is messed up, this group of people. In fact, it's way worse than just these little things that we're listing. You list things on social media as if there's a big surprise, like, oh, can you believe so and so did this? Like, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We're all seriously messed up. Like, our heart is so um, messed up that it's, the Bible says it's immeasurable. <laughs> like, what's the big surprise, right? It's out of, like left to ourselves, what this says, left to ourselves, by default, you and I would steal. We would lie. If we could get away with it, we would cheat. We would slander and talk behind other people's backs. We would sleep around and we would kill people. That's just, that's just our human nature. That just comes naturally from within. And that's what he's saying here is that we are defiled by that. Our hearts are depraved, right? We, we know good, but we prefer evil. We see the light, but we love darkness. And it just, our heart, my heart, your heart becomes this internal sin factory. It's just producing this all the time, like weeds in a garden. It's just like, where did that thought come from? Where did this come from? And it's funny how the pastor, the leading pastor here in the United States said this. He said, 99.9% .9 of people are not bad people. They just make poor choices. But deep down, they have a good heart. <laughs> That's coming from the, the leading, like, biggest church in America. And I want to just say to you on this that that's a lie. The Bible says there, there's none righteous. No, not one. There is no one who seeks after God. All have turned aside. That, that it's a systemic problem. We have a defiled heart. And so the big idea today is that man will look on the outside and we make it all about who's good and who's bad, right? And God, Jesus answers and says, dude, like, we're all, there's a defilement problem deep down on the inside and we all are messed up to the core. So uh, let's land this plane because you came here today, maybe you watch, are watching today and you're like, I need something encouraging. Or I'm like, this is not helping any. Like, I need, I need, I need something here. Well, this is just a part of the message that God had. And we, I want to kind of close with the rest of the message. Here's the good news. The Holy Spirit is here to convict the world of sin. And he's doing his work. We don't have to add to his work. But the Holy Spirit is not going to clean the outside of your cup, right? The Bible says that the Holy Spirit comes and he takes an ax to the root, right? He's going to come down to the core, put an ax to the root. And if you respond properly to the Holy Spirit, what he's going to do is he's going to take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. He's going to take what was hard and was unchangeable and he's going to make you moldable before God. It's a beautiful thing. It's actually a miracle of God that the Spirit of God does that and he, he performs that in your life. And when you see it, right, then the beauty is that you can, that you can respond to that, that you can respond to the working of the Holy Spirit. I believe that the Holy Spirit works through and he, he makes our hearts tender through difficult things. It was Charles Spurgeon who had said that um, long-standing um, prosperity and material things are not healthy for the human heart, right? In 1 Timothy chapter 6, um, there are all these things that people will run after to their own detriment. And um, Spurgeon even said that um, if, you, if you don't have a physical ailment, you can become... Um, you can go off and you can become self-sufficient. You can become proud. And oftentimes it's through hardship, isn't it? That God softens our hearts. And all of a sudden we, we become open and pliable and we say, yeah, I'm not where I ought to be. There's probably more selfishness in my life than there ought to be. And the beauty of that, this is the good news, 
is that the Bible says that if we confess, right? If we confess, if we, that's basically agreeing with God. Yeah, it's true. Like my condition is worse than I would have expected. If we confess, then God comes in like a father, like a faithful father, and he provides justice. And this is how he provides justice. He says, I'm going to make a just declaration. I'm going to be the sacrifice for all the things that you've done wrong. And there's going to be a replacement here. And you're going to be declared just before God. I'm going to give you my righteousness. There's going to be a transfer, a new creation. You'll be born again and God sets you free. I love the description of this, that, that he is faithful to cleanse us. You notice the defilement problem, how it's, it feels so negative. You have to admit the depth of your defilement, but then God comes in and he does this cleansing work. So you don't have to carry the weight anymore of having to impress anybody. <laughs> He's the one who does the cleansing work. And when he does the cleansing work, then he completely changes you. And I love in Revelation 1, to Jesus who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. That's what he has done by his blood. He set us free. He set us free from this constant knowledge of good and evil. And it's like, I don't know, like I'm not good enough, but he set you free by his blood. You know what that does to you and to me? It humbles us, doesn't it? It makes us more gracious. When, when you realize the depth of what God has given you, when you realize that you found the treasure beyond measure, <laughs> when you realize as the beggar that you found the pot of gold, right? Something just changes in you and, and you start being more loving and gracious towards other people, right? And you start saying, why is everybody accusing and criticizing? We, we know all these things. We know we suck, right? But I can't believe that I'm forgiven. And you just want other people to know that. Listen, if you're watching in today, and, and you haven't made this your own, I encourage you to pray and say, Jesus, I confess that, that my, I am a sinner, that my sin problem is too large to handle. Thank you that you died on the cross, that you paid the price, that you want to cleanse me. Save me, God. Save me and call out to him. Begin that relationship with him, not because you deserve it, <laughs> but because he loves you. He wants to be able to say, I want to set you free and I want to set you free. I want to remove this burden of guilt from you and I want to set you free. If you're a believer and you've already done that, the Bible says that as the vine and the branch, because you abide in him, because you're in connection with him, fruit just starts to happen automatically. And it's just so cool because it's like, I, I didn't produce this fruit. It's actually God producing love, joy, peace, patience, producing good works through me. I, I couldn't have done that on my own. And it's so freeing to say, hey, I'm, I'm with Christ and he's going to do these works through me. I want to um, pray with you and then we'll, we'll, take, um, we'll take communion together and have a little time to reflect on this. So Lord, we just want to thank you for um, the beauty of this scripture that it actually takes the pressure off when we look at the outside, that man looks on the outward, but God, you, you look at the heart. And Lord, I just want to thank you for hearts that have been tenderized and made sensitive to the Spirit of God, to the conviction of God. And as a church, we just confess to you, God, that yeah, we are selfish to the core and we're prone to wander. But thank you so much for the love and the forgiveness of Christ, God. And we're just overwhelmed today by the fact that you love us and that you freed us from our sins by your blood. And we thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have a great opportunity just to reflect a little bit um, for ourselves. I want to give you the chance just to, to, to talk to Jesus a little bit during this time of communion. So if you're a believer, the Bible actually encourages us to remember um, what Christ has done for us. And so we're going to do that together. I brought um, a cup and some bread, and um, maybe you have some there at home that you want to use uh, for this as, as we go through this um, symbolic and reflective event. So I have the bread um, represents the body of Christ, and it's a very vivid reminder of the price that Jesus paid uh, for us to be set free. His body 
was broken for us. It was broken, torn apart for us. He, he paid, he did the heavy lifting, he paid the price. And so let's just pray a little bit. Maybe you want to just, if there's something that comes to mind that you want to confess to God during this time, um, you can do that and then we'll take the bread together. Lord, we just want to thank you today that you see all of us and if there are sins of omission or commission, things that we aren't even aware of, that you, that you offer to cleanse us and to set us free from those things, God. And so we just confess to you as a church body that, yeah, we, we are um, we're prone to just making it about ourselves. And we ask that you'd forgive us, that you would cleanse us. And today we acknowledge the fact that your body was broken for us and we, we accept it gratefully and with humble hearts. In Jesus' name, let's take the bread together. There is, there is um, so much power in the blood of Christ. This represents um, complete cleansing and being set free. Um, this represents a resource that is hourly, daily, that minute by minute, that, it, that spreads throughout your entire life. That Christ is saying, just claim the blood of Jesus on, on, over your life. And he's going to do the transforming work in you. And so... Just pray for a couple minutes and thank him for his blood. Any other things that come to your mind that you want to thank him for about who he is, just take a few moments to do that and then we'll take the cup together. Thank you, Jesus, that there's power in the blood of Jesus. We, we thank you that you've actually set us free. You've cleansed us of all unrighteousness. Thank you that you paid the ultimate price, God in the flesh, hanging on the cross, and that we've been set free. We worship you and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take the cup together. Lord, we just want to thank you for this beautiful time that we can worship you. And I pray that you would just bless this, this final song that we could just enter in and, and spend these moments just worshiping you for who you are. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.
new through everything God thank you for that spirit of truth that just brings life God that brings light into the darkest places God and sets us sets us on the right path God towards you God we give you our whole hearts God we surrender to you all we have and all we are in Jesus name
Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to gathering either online or in person next week. Our services happen every week here at CFC. Right now, you can join us outdoor on Saturday nights at 7 p.m. or in our main auditorium on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Please register for all on-site services at communityfellowship.com beginning the Tuesday before the weekend. You can also join us online each Sunday on Facebook at 9 a.m. or on YouTube, Vimeo, or on our website at communityfellowship.com. Lastly, if you'd like to support the mission and vision of CFC financially, you can do so at our website or by using our Alexio app. Have a great day.